make joke. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The more comfortable you are with your truth, the more the easier it will be for you to share it. You have to become, which again is my book, right? I it my secrets kept me prisoner for years and it kept me from being me. And then as soon as I decided, screw it, I'm going to release it all. And I'm going to expose my own secrets. It's been unbelievably liberating. So you're in Toronto. Yes. Yes. You're not too far, but the border's not open. I'm in Rochester, right outside of Buffalo. So yeah, we, I believe I can, I can come there, but you can't come here right now. I think we can drive, but we can, no. I know people who have, who have flown. You can fly, but I, I don't right. know. Maybe it's the other. I don't know. I know, but that I know people who have been flying. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. So I haven't gone anywhere. Um, all right. So I guess, well, let's start with uh, your childhood. All right. So, okay. Basically, this is, this is me in a nutshell. So actually okay. on paper. Yeah. Everything was great. Like I was, I, there, my life was, this was not supposed to be my life. Like on paper, everything was great. So I was, I guess, middle-class, right. um, both parents. Uh, I was the youngest of three kids. My brother was five years older, sister, seven years older, very close with my brother, very close with my mom. Um, and then when I was 10, um, my parents got divorced. Now, not a huge deal. Um, I, I should say before that I was growing up, I was the feistiest, most like fearless kid ever. I was very into sports and I was also a little performer. I would dance and I would sing and, and I wasn't intimidated by anybody. My mother really encouraged me to be outspoken and I would stand up for injustice when I would see it. And, um, really like, and I, I used to say, I used to joke that I peaked when I was eight. Um, <laughs> and then, so my parents got divorced and, and at the time, uh, I was the first kid in my elementary school whose parents got divorced. So it was 1980 and it was not the thing it is now. Well, right? for me, it was the prepared. early seventies and nobody. Oh, wow. I was, yeah. So 80, I was in high school, but um, no, when I was in school, like nobody in my neighborhood, the, nobody's parents were divorced. Um, yeah, it was, it was, and I went to like a very Catholic school only because my, they, nothing to do with religion. I mean, my father right. owned a strip club, I mean, you know what I mean? It was, I don't know why they made me go to that school, but it didn't make it any better. Yeah. Having no, was, my father was... and what he did, having right. a, coming from a divorced family, that no, didn't sure. make, <laughs> I yeah, should have well, been in public school choice. with all the other degenerates, <laughs> my people. <laughs> That's funny. Um, but still, so, so the thing that was difficult about it was that my father, my father wasn't terribly involved, but he, he really, he didn't want to be married, didn't want to have kids. He, he became like, uh, he owned a, a jewelry business that he ran in the ground because he would like have hookers in the stock room and, and, you know, doing drugs with the employees. And, and he just didn't, he just didn't want any of it. So he, he sort of, he took off and there was no child support. There was no spousal support, nothing. And, and my mom who had gotten married at 19 had to raise these three kids on her own. And uh, she had no support from her family, but we were, it, it actually was okay. I mean, it was difficult, but it was okay because it brought the rest of us closer. So I was very, very close to my mother who was just a fantastic, love personified. I had a very hard childhood and, and very hard life and was not bitter at all. And she pulled um, her shit together. And she was, it, she and- was just love. She was just love. Yeah. She wanted to be everything that her parents weren't. And she That's was just amazing. Amazing that it she was. broke and the cycle. She did. and then my sister and I weren't very close. We were, we are now, but we were very, very different. And also at seven years apart, you're going through things very, very different. differently. Yeah. Um, and then my brother was like, my brother, I used, to, I used to say my brother was the invisible armor I wore out in the world. And, and he knew when to stand in front of me to protect me and when to stand behind me, encouraging me to protect myself. And I like looked at him like he was the sun, the moon, the stars. And my life really changed when I was 17 and my brother got sick and he died and I was not prepared. He, he'd been born with a, a hereditary liver disease, but we had no idea until it was too late. So I wasn't, I was writing an English exam when I was pulled out of my exam and, uh, and told he died. That and fast? well, no, it took in my brain. It was, it was fast, it, but you no, know, we were going to the hospital. Um, but still they were trying to keep it from me, how sick he was, even though I okay. knew he, he had a transplant and then he had to have another one, but he was 21 years old and he'd been oh. athletic and, and healthy his whole life. So 
Billy wasn't going to die. I mean, this was my Billy, you know, right, this is my big right. brother. Like he's not going to die. Um, and my mother had sent me to school that day because in her mind, it was, I was writing my last English exam in high school. And if she kept me home from an exam, then to her, she was admitting that something was very wrong. And I don't, I don't think that she could, she couldn't accept that. So she sent me to school. And that's when I was pulled out of, of class and taken to the hospital and, and he had died. And I say all the time too, that the minute before I heard he died was the last minute I felt safe for many, many years. Because to me, if that could happen, then anything bad can happen. And I felt no and sense of control over my life. he was also almost like a father figure to you. He was. Too, he was. You know, he, he was just such a great. And, yeah. yeah. He, he was. So he you was looked up to him as a male figure in your life. And absolutely. Yeah. That's. He, yeah. He absolutely protected me and, and, and loved me. And, and, and what was interesting was I remember when he went into the hospital, I remember um, I, I was always very confident about my, my body. I never had an issue with it. Um, but it was about 16, you know, you're starting to get the societal pressure. And I remember thinking, should I lose weight? And I remember seeing him in the hospital. No, before that, I remember telling him, should I lose weight? And he was like, no, you're beautiful. They'll, they'll never accept you at like Weight Watchers. You're, you're perfect. And when he went into the hospital, I have this memory of going to see him and saying, I joined Weight Watchers. And I remember he shook his head like, you're crazy. But it became my way of controlling. So two things happened. I, Billy's death gave birth to my eating disorder because it was a control. I can control nothing. At 17, I felt completely out of control. My whole world was rocked. What's the one thing I could control was my body. Mm -hmm. I controlled what I ate, what I didn't eat, how much exercise I, I did. So I felt, you know, people would bring food to the hospital and I wouldn't eat it because I felt like I was doing something. It was doing something. Um, the other thing was I felt that he deserved to be on the planet more than I did. I felt that he was a better person than I was. And so if I was going to be here instead of him, I had to earn my spot. And I didn't feel like I was a good enough person for that. So my eating disorder convinced me that maybe I could be skinny enough. And I started to weigh my worth in numbers. And I always say, and I hated every pound. Um, and I, I became obsessed with my weight. And <laughs> that carried through. But I also, I mean, I won't get into everything, but I went to see my family doctor at one point who, even though I was always a healthy weight, very active, this doctor who I realized later was very messed up berated me and, and basically told me that society was thin, but a society, you no, know, what he said was you're healthy. You're, you're not medically overweight, but society is very thin. And if you want to look good in a bathing suit, you need to lose 10 pounds. Wow. And he had me write down everything I ate and bring it to him at the end of the week. And he would yell at me if I ate something that he didn't think was, um, was How okay. And I, I was 17, had lost my brother two months earlier, had told him I was becoming obsessed with my weight and didn't want him. I didn't want to know what I weighed. And again, I was, it's not me being irresponsible. I was at a healthy weight and active and no one in my family had a weight problem. But he said, I'm going to tell you what you weigh. And he kept pointing at my stomach saying, what is that? Look at that. I wouldn't wear a bathing suit. And I ended up losing the 10 pounds and then another 10 and then another 10. And then when he said, okay, you can stop now. I thought, fuck you. <laughs> I lost the first 10 as a fuck you to him. But I was the one that ended up getting screwed because I ended up with this horrible eating disorder. I was, had just been accepted into a theater school. I dropped out. Um, I just, it, it took over. I just wanted to disappear. Um, and then I ended up kind of, getting my shit together a bit and moving. I was in Montreal and I moved from Montreal to Toronto. Um, now, not to, I, I, I'm not going to get into the whole thing, but I will say that from that point, I would love to say that life gave me a break, <laughs> but life, life just kept hitting me hard. And unfortunately, when you go into the world with a, a severe body image issue or, or a severe insecurity, it's like trying to build a house on quicksand. You just can't. So I didn't have this this foundation, as great as my mom was, it, it, my eating disorder had taken over. And I was feeling, I felt like I just, I had nothing to offer. Um, and that set me, that set me up on this really bad path. And so I ended up getting married and to somebody I thought was great. And I won't say negative. I mean, we have two amazing kids, but um, again, life, life got hard. So everything from um, after my brother died, um, less than a year later, my stepfather was arrested for bank robbery. A few months after that, my mom got breast cancer. Um, then she gets better. I move, I get married. 
Um, I, I get pregnant, miscarry, pregnant, miscarry, get pregnant. My mother's super excited. And then four months before my son is born, my mom dies. I was completely unprepared for that. Um, then my son, I almost lose the son I was pregnant with. And then I, he, he makes it. And then I get pregnant again. And this time I end up with um, a, a mysterious illness uh, that landed me in the hospital for two months, kidney failure, respiratory failure. Um, I was given a 25% chance of surviving and lost the baby that I was pregnant with um, five and a half months along and had to learn how to walk again and talk again um, and breathe again on my own and got through that and um, oh, okay. got pregnant. Wait, wait, wait. How, how, how? <laughs> How did your mother pass? So my mother had been battling breast cancer for years and, and kept mm -hmm. sort of overcoming it. Right. And then, well, she, you'll see in my book, she mm -hmm. got screwed by her doctors. There was negligence. They saw something, didn't tell her about it. When she found out that there was something there, they said, oh, nothing. I've seen it. It's been there for 10 years. My mother's like, it's been it for 10 years. What do you mean? It's nothing. And she kept saying, I want to biopsy it. I've had, she had a mastectomy already. Like she dealt with breast cancer. And they were like, it's nothing like her doctor made her feel like he, she was wasting everyone's time. And my mother, who was not an aggressive person at all, except when it came to her children, like our well-being. But she said, write down on a piece of paper, this is not cancer and sign your name. And he said, I can't do that. And she said, well, then I want to get a biopsy. And she did. And it was it was it was malignant and it had it had spread. But what happened was by this time I had moved to the West Coast. I was in Vancouver. And when I got pregnant, we were on the phone like three times a day because we were that close. When I got pregnant for the third time after two miscarriages, her cancer was back. She didn't want me to know how serious it was because she was afraid that since it was a high risk pregnancy, she didn't want to stress me out. So we would literally talk three times a day. She would call me with her pregnancy cravings because this was like our baby. But she didn't tell me until I went for um, my first ultrasound. And everything was fine. And I was scheduled to fly into Montreal three days later. And my sister called me and said, you need to come in to come home now. I said, I'm coming home in three days. And she said, no, mommy's dying and she won't make it. So, so again, she tried to sort of protect me, but I was, I was blindsided and I, I flew in. And you she didn't went into realize a coma that night. she was that bad because you no didn't one did. She her. didn't even, even my oh, sister who was sister in Montreal, did. not even because, because she hit it. She didn't, she didn't want ever, anyone to her. So when my sister saw her, my, my, my mom's boyfriend had brought my mom to my sister's place and my, and she was in terrible shape. And my sister's like, how do, what's going on? And she called my mom's doctor and my mom's doctor said, I told her to tell you both months ago, but she was so concerned about us being stressed and, and she didn't want to hurt us that she didn't tell us. But meanwhile, here I, I totally deteriorating I was pregnant, and you guys and didn't know. No, I mean, I, I walked into the hospital room. I, and she also, she was somebody who she, so when I went in, she was in palliative care and, you know, you go in there and they let you smoke, they let you drink because you're not getting out. And they sort of let you do what you want. But my mother, my sister told me, my mother said to to said to the doctor, the day they brought her in, she said, I'm going to be your first patient that walks out of here. She was not ready to go. She wanted to come and spend half the year in Vancouver with me, with the baby, like, she wasn't ready. So again, she wasn't telling me because in her mind, she was going to, she was going to be okay. So I had way to of then staying positive. Yeah. And, and, and to try to protect us. But then what happened right. was what happened was, so when I, so just to tell you how I got into the next part of the book is that when, when my brother died, the, the grief was too heavy for my 17 year old brain. That's why the eating disorder came up. It was a distraction easier to focus on my empty belly than his empty room. So that, that pushed the trauma down. When my, um, when my mom died, I was pregnant and I couldn't deal with that trauma. So I, because I wanted to take care of the baby that I was carrying, right? So I pushed that grief down. When I got sick and I was in the hospital and I lost the baby I was carrying, when I got out, I couldn't deal with that because I had my, my older son was 16 months old. I, I, I didn't want to you know, lose my mind when I had to take care of him. So I pushed the grief down. When you push it down, you're not getting rid of it. You're just pushing it down where it could do the most damage. And what ended up happening was I had moved back from Vancouver, um, reconnected with my father for a minute before he passed away a few months later. Um, I had another baby, everything was great. But uh, 
something 